thank you all for uh, getting so early and, and being here. Uh, first, uh, public comments announcements. I see we have none. Uh, consent agenda, we have none. Abatements, none. Old and unfinished business. We're going to go right to new business. Ty and Bond, uh, per peer review analysis and full rate study presentation. Excellent. Okay. Um, again, my name is Mike Schrader. Can you have to work better from chairs? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can uh, sit and talk, but I'll, uh, I'll try. So, um, Time Bond was asked to do an analysis of, um, of the, the town of Harwich's which is water rates uh, in anticipation of moving to quarterly billing, but we also just sort of gave it a, um, a review. And when I look at water rates uh, or sewer rates, which are really the same um, principles, I look for a couple things. I look for revenue sufficiency which means are you raising enough money to cover your operations? And operations includes everything. It includes um, you know, your day-to-day -day operating expenses. It includes capital expenses, uh, debt service. So I, I look to see that. Um, for that part of the evaluation, uh, it's <coughs> usually more of, of a deeper understanding of your capital needs. Are you really funding you know, your capital, or is it just sort of getting pushed to the side, which is what happens pretty commonly? And then the other thing I looked at, which was more of a focus for HAR, which was revenue stability. So how susceptible are you to, um, to changes in the weather and, and that sort of thing? And uh, I am not a so uh, socio uh, economist, but I, I'm certainly fascinated by it. And one of the things I look to um, here that I see is that the Cape has a sort of a micro economy that um, – you know, where a lot of the tourists and the visitors come from Massachusetts or from other parts of the state or New England, and um, having my, my in-laws live in Hyannis. So having, you know, my kids and our kids growing up that way, you might be planning to go to the Cape this weekend, and then on Tuesday the weatherman says it might rain, and everybody changes their plans because they don't want to be stuck in Grandma's house with all the kids and that kind of thing. So where, that, where I'm going with that is that um, that puts – like seasonal fluctuations. So a lot of communities, when you're looking at seasonal changes, it's mostly people watering the lawns, right? And I, I think on the Cape, it's as much of a function as the people that come with it. So even though, you know, grandma's house might have a small yard that they do or don't water, it's those 10 kids that are not taking a tub after the beach, or they're not eating dinner, they're not, you know. So I think it's really interesting, and it, and it makes it um, – you know, even more of a challenge. So that's one of the things I, I zeroed in on for Harwich. So uh, let me just see if I make the clicker work. So what we looked at, too, is we look at tier setting. Um, so you have a tiered water rate um, structure where you pay more as you go. And the, the concept with tiers is um, regardless of how many numbers you actually have, it's really three sets. It's the, the minimum is supposed to be responsible usage. That's what you need. You know, water is a component of daily life. You need it to, to do your, your daily um, activities. Then the middle is um, discretionary usage. It's where you're using a little bit more. Maybe you have a garden or you're washing your car, that kind of thing. And then that third tier is, is really what they call wasteful usage. And the challenge with water utilities is, is I'm sure you know, most of your costs are fixed. And you know, people have this concept that it really changes with how much water you make. But the truth is it doesn't vary that much. It's, you know, there's certain costs, electrical costs. Um, overtime in, in the summertime, you know, you guys are staying until 10 o'clock to fill the tank, and then, you know, they go home, whereas in the winter they don't have to. But the truth is it's really a fixed, a, uh, a fixed expense industry. And the reason that we have consumption rates at all is really because you couldn't manage it otherwise. People would just empty their pool every day and fill it with fresh water because there was no restriction. So it's that balance of, you know, from an economic perspective, you'd be well served to just have one fee. Everybody pays a fee and then you manage your business and much less to worry about, but you need to manage that as a resource as well. So that's why we have rates. And we look at the tier setting to see um, is, is it, are they too high or too low? Are they, are they capturing the right amount of people? And then revenue stability, we look at, like I said, that susceptibility to seasonal variances, which is very complicated. There's a whole lot that goes into it. 
Uh, and then last, you just look at the rate structure itself. So um, at, at the end, we're going to talk about um, what a full rate evaluation would look like. So this is sort of an abbreviated uh, third party just looking at um, certain numbers. And I have to say that the data was um, very nice. Um, you know, you can already tell that you guys are doing a good job of running your department, which is, which is always nice to see. So the one thing I also look at is total consumption. And this is a, a place where people don't, um, when you're looking at projecting rates, you have to start with consumption. That's what you're selling. And so, for example, if you've done nothing with your water rates for 10 years, but you're losing 2% a year to reduce consumption, which I see frequently, then you're, you're already dropping a little bit behind because of the economy or, or just general cost escalation, and you're dropping because you're losing revenue in the form of, of conservation. So the first thing we do is we always look at what your conservation, what your consumption history has been. And, um, so your consumption is generally trending up about 3% per year. And you can see that there's you know, some high years and some low years. 213 was a low year. Um, those vary regionally as well. And it's, again, it's fascinating, you know, the, the, the people side of, of water use and what makes it go up and go down. Um, and also when we look at, when we do a model, we look at, um, everything's about projections. Looking at the past to project for the future. And in a lot of communities, uh, especially right in this time that we're in, I don't want to use 2017 as, a, as, you know, just extend off last year because that was a bumper year for most people. We had the, the summer that never ended, right? You people used a ton of water. But, you know, then 18, and I had people call, you know, the first quarter 18 came in and said, our, our revenues are really down. Our, we're not pumping that much water. Is that going to affect us? I'm like, I didn't use 17 as the projection because we knew that that was a high year. So... This is um, this might be a little tricky to to explain, but one of the simple ways to look at tier settings is uh, is everybody familiar with the term residential gallons per capita per day? So that that's the amount of water per person that you use. So it's based on the residential consumption divided by your summer popu or by your population serve, which is another tricky thing because you have such a change in, in population. So I, I believe you guys average summer and winter. But this is a number that they report to the state in part of their um, annual statistical reports. And it's, it's a great indicator because it tells me how much water you guys use versus every other community. So the state looks at, um, state looks at 65 gallons per capita per day um, as their Benchmark. That's what they're trying to get people to. High, which is actual, last year was 77, so it's a little high, um, which it means whatever it means. You know what I mean? It just it just shows that the water use here is a little bit high compared to that. But anyway, if you break it down, and uh, I'm going to say it's really hard to come up with like a clever graphic that just shows this, but so you take this number, this 15,000. That's your tier one limit, right? And I break it down and I say, well, how many people would have to live in a house to use that much water? What does that look like? So if you had two people living in a house or a, a count, they'd be using around 41 gallons per capita per day. If you had three, they'd be 27. And if you had four, they'd be 20. So that tells me that um, tier one's a low setting, which is, which is appropriate. And then this number, this actual number, either the 65 or the 77, falls somewhere between two and three people in the tier two. And what that um, tells me is that, you know, most of them are falling in that range. Your, again, it's the, the, the CAPE is a completely different paradigm. Most uh, communities, it's around three people per household, like 3.1, you know, per, per household. So that, that tells me that, you know, in a nutshell, that those tiers are probably set pretty well. They're not, you don't want it where tier one, where everybody's under it. That means it's too, it's too generous, you know. You, you want to capture the right amount of people in your second tier and then the right amount in your third tier. So uh, in a nutshell, from this perspective, your tiers look set pretty well. The next thing relative to tier setting is to look at, 
um, the percentage of usage that falls in each tier. So for each one of these uh, blocks, again, this is, uh, this is tricky stuff to just summarize, but for each year we looked at, we had a fall and a spring. And, and this is where it gets really counterintuitive because when you look at the fall, that's the summer usage. And when you look at the spring, that's the winter usage, right? Which is nice when you have uh, biannual <coughs> readings because you, you, you don't have to do a lot of work to separate summer from winter. It's already separated that way naturally. So the counterintuitive part means that when you see 57% of people in tier one for the, say, spring 2013, that means people were using less water. You know, because more of that was captured in tier one. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we break it down to try to make this a little easier to look at. And I say, okay, that first tier, what does that look like? What is the variability in there? And you can see that there's two ranges. On the higher end, um, there was, um, they're pretty stable, pretty consistent. And you see that 213 was um, a little bit more tier one usage, and that's because, um, oops, so this is a, the lower usage. Again, very, very consistent. So your winter, that, that shows you have a steady winter population. They're, you, they're doing the same thing over and over. And you remember tier 2013 was a low year, so that explains for this little bump uh, of higher, call it tier one containment, you know, so again, the bars represent the number of accounts that, that were totally within tier one, you know what I mean? And then the next bar will be the number of accounts that went into tier two and, and so forth. So this makes sense and it shows that, um, again, it's, it's pretty consistent, which is nice to see. Um, and then tier two and tier three, also very, very consistent, right? So 27, Twenty-three to 27% in tier two and then tier three. Again, you know, if you put that on top of the other bars, you would see that that's a pretty um, fairly consistent piece. What gets interesting is tier four. So tier four is your, your highest tier and it's where um, that extra usage goes. When people are using a lot of water, it goes into tier four and also you're, you're also mostly uh, residential here, not a lot of big commercial. And in a lot of communities I see, they don't have a separate rate for commercial, but they'll use the same tiers for everybody. So sort of by default, you could be the most green company in the world, but just because of your size, you're gonna go into the higher tier. And frankly, that's sort of a backdoor way that, that people charge more for commercial users. Uh, I don't see it a big deal here because you don't have that many. Um, but what I looked at here is I say, wow, okay, this doesn't look like a lot, but there's quite a bit more tier four usage in some um, years than other. And this is only by number of accounts, right? So the dollars go up by tier um, as well. So you have to look at the total revenue. So when I look at the total revenue here, I'm only showing the amount of money that comes from tier four. So. This is, again, um, feel free to stop me and back me up. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going slow because I'm trying to be clear because it's a little confusing. So this is the two halves of 2013. So in the fall, which again represents summer use, 17% of the total revenue for the year, not just for that half year, came from that tier four. And 4% came from um, the winter usage in tier four. And you see that winter side is pretty consistent, four, five, six percent. But the top goes up 21, 28, 29, 30, 22. And if we just break that down and bring down that tier one so we can look at that against the zero, I really focused on, on the differences, the outliers. So when you look at it, um, you know, it's, you have to normalize a little bit because your water use has gone up. So like I said, there's a lot of mitigating factors here. But when I look at it, I say, okay, in 2013, you got 17% of your total revenue from tier four. In 2016, you got 30% of your total revenue from tier four. So to me, what that says is um, whatever, if you had the same conditions in 2013, in 2016, 
that means that all of this revenue that's uh, is above that line is potentially at risk, right? They, that same thing could happen again. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing because it's a good year when you make more water, you make more revenue. But you want to look at what are the impacts if we had that same conditions again, and what would that do to your, your financials, and what would the impact be? And that's what I mean by stability. So we're talking about cash flow coming in the door. So you've had a great year, a great year. What if you have that, that low usage year again? What would that look like? So there's no pretty way to go through this. But what I did was I looked at, and this is a slide. I'm sorry. I apologize. I realized that I didn't have this slide in the first time. So this is not in your packets. Um, I can provide it after. I right, apologize. That's right. no, it's but Thank I, you for stopping us. <laughs> I, um, I just want to see if you're, you're paying attention. And, and, and <laughs> but I looked at, um, this is like a quick balance sheet. So I looked at your expenses, your operating expenses, your debt service, your capital or articles, your total expenses. And then underneath you have your revenues, your rate revenue, non-rate revenue, and total revenue. Um, and then the total net revenue is the um, your plus, you know, where you are ahead. So in, and these these slides all go backwards um, in time. So you had seven hundred forty-five thousand dollars, you know, call it. Um, I don't want to call it surplus revenue because that sounds wrong because it's it's a it's a uh, an industry of balances, right? So you want to maintain good reserves, and I think you guys have done a good job with that. So this would be your contribution to reserves, if you will, so it lets you do uh, more things. And the cumulative net revenue as a percent of your operating ranged from 26%. So I started like a balance here. I said, okay, let's just say we're starting at FY14 with 696,000. You add 269,000 to that, you get to 965. You add 422, you get to 1.3. You add another 75. So this is sort of recreating what your reserves might look like, right? So what I just wanted to understand is what proportion that looks like. So the next slide is what does that tier four revenue represent um, as part of that? And what if it went back to that baseline, to that lowest usage? So what I did was I said, all right, that was your tier four, four revenue. Your actual revenue was 23% of the year, 36, 37, and 19. What if we reset it all to 19 and I brought it back? So that would be a net change in revenue of zero for this year because it's the same amount, uh, a negative 18% drop, a 17% drop, and a 4% drop. And I basically recalculated to see um, what would that have looked like if we were back at that baseline and um, let me see if I can go backwards. So yes, I managed to <laughs> croak the projector. So I apologize for that. Let me just go through here. So here, this is where I wanted to go back to, we're at 26% of your reserves, I mean 20% of your, 26% as your operating percentage to 72% as an accumulation, and that would drop down to 28%. So this is not a, um, there's no bad news here, it's just that you just need to be aware that, that you have that vulnerability and that Really what it's telling me is you need to pay attention to your reserves to make sure that you're, you're buffering or you have that ability should that revenue drop again. And um, that's really the um, sort of the net takeaway here is we, we looked at, uh, and I think our recommendations were you could, one, you want to maintain a good reserves because there is some, some vulnerability here. Um, two, we could look at, um, you know, you can, you can change rates. You don't have to change them across the board. You can change them individually. So we might want to look at that tier three and tier four, both the, um, the setting for the tier and the, and the dollars for the tier. So if you were concerned or if you don't want to maintain uh, heavy reserves, 
you would want to shift some of that revenue uh, back into like tier two and tier three, which makes it less important for that tier four. And tier four would be more of a, um, a bumper, you, you know, like an extra um, capacity. And I think, yeah, that, that was actually my last slide. Um, that's a little confusing. Does that make sense? Do you have any yeah, questions? Sure. Well, one thing, uh, one thing I have always wondered over the years: what is the ideal reserve that this department? That's a great question. Um, I recommend that people one that you have a policy because that makes your job easier. Because when people say something, you say, "I'm, I am uh, acting in accordance with our our accepted policies." Um, what you want to do is you want to be roughly the bottom is is 16% or 15% of your operating revenue and that's about two months worth of um, two months worth of, of expenses there's a whole range of that that's my rule of thumb but there's a whole range you know you can look at your biggest piece of plant and service so if you had a, a one big piece of equipment you're really concerned about you want to maintain that you can look at your um, some places look at the, the biggest operating loss in the last three years and want to maintain that amount. But I, I usually just set as a, as a baseline, and we'll show when I do the model demonstration that we, we set it between 16 and upwards of 50%, just to keep you in a band. And you'll like this because the, the whole model works like a water system. The, the reserves is the water in the tank, and you want to keep enough water in the tank so that something happens. You can you can draw from your your tank, and so that that is your question, and I, I believe you guys were um, above that. Yeah. So uh, one thing in the past we we cut the budget, cut back spending mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that uh, we, we closed out the year. And and that's important too. So you know, being efficient and um, doing. You know, maintaining good operational um, budgets is really important, but it, it's also important to make sure you're you're investing back in your system. Mm -hmm. And that um, I don't really have any baseline here, but I've I've seen if I hear someone say we haven't raised rates in 20 years, you know they're not doing anything, that they're just pushing. You know, and that's frankly why the country gets a D minus for infrastructure is because there's been a lack of investment yeah. in maintaining them. And um, you know, you need to just keep that baseline reinvestment going. Mm. Uh, just <coughs> All right. Uh, anything else for mm. any, any questions, other questions from Michael at this time? There's gonna be a second, a second slideshow sh from? Um, we have, uh, Sandy, I guess it's you has a slideshow on the quarterly rates, are you? Um, yeah. Does Jamie have that? If you don't, Jamie, I do. You want me to come for it? Thank you for the uh, first presentation. That was very helpful. It was uh, nice to see that we're trending in the right direction. You'll, some of it will make more sense when I show you how the model works. Right. It, it's yeah. Some of it's taken out of context, but yeah, it's, it's, um, you guys are doing a good job, which is nice. Well, you know, part, of, part, part of the problem with the whole thing is that, uh, uh, it, it, you know, uh, over the years, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, the, the, the department didn't increase rates because they didn't have the revenue, they weren't able to keep the revenue and went into general fund. Right. So, uh, I mean, it just, like you had commented, that this really is just stagnant. I mean. Well, what's interesting is <coughs> um, I was in high school when Proposition Two and a Half came out, and at that point, there were no enterprise funds. Everybody was in the general fund, and they would use special revenue sometimes, but I, I'm not sure of the history of that. But the enterprise funding came out like four years later, and I think it was to get people out of the general fund, and that's why they let you set enterprises negative, positive, or neutral, because mm -hmm. I think it was to wean people off it. It's not the, the water, by the way, it was the general fund, because yep. what, what makes money in a town, besides your, your taxes, is water and sewer. Yeah. So if that was in the general fund, 
And then you were competing with you know, schools and libraries and everything else, and that money never seemed to find its way to the yeah. invisible infrastructure. Yep. So that's why they came out. I, I, think, I don't think it's a coincidence that those two legislations came out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Somebody got wise to the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Yep. Dan. All right. So um, Sandy and I had put together some slides just to kind of go over some of the more Harwich-specific um, things for our quarterly billing proposal. So I'll jump right in. Um, some of the quick quarterly billing statistics um, we pulled from Time Bond's Massachusetts water rate study. And in the two pie charts that are on this show, a decrease of biannual billing of 23% from the year 2000 to the year 2017. Um, quarterly went up from 46 to 58 percent and as you can see in the the second chart on the bottom that some some <coughs> are moving to monthly as well um, in the same survey just wanted to point out that the <coughs> annual cost for water for Harwich based on the annual average of 90,000 gallons is three hundred and seventy six dollars as compared to the state average which is five hundred and ninety five dollars so one of the things that's come up and has been asked in, in other public forums is, you know, what are the benefits, one, to the residents? Um, the Water Commission would be concerned to what benefits there are for the Water Department and what, what are mutually beneficial. So for the Water Department, um, one of the benefits would be following the recommended guidelines from MassDEP. They like to see more frequent, consistent, um, billing, they like to see a more consistent cash flow. Um, for the residents, it's going to be a more frequent and a smaller bill. So it's going to distribute the cost of water more evenly throughout the year, and it's going to be able to provide the customers with a more direct correlation between water consumption and water cost. And I think one of the mutually beneficial things is leak detection. Mm. And that that's significantly more important, in my opinion, than, than people give it credit for. Mm. Um, you know, you guys have processed or heard many abatements where someone will come in and there's a, a leak on the homeowner's side of the plumbing of a leaking toilet and those bills can go up in excess of, you know, $5,000. So with the moving to quarterly reading, we're going to catch those homeowner leaks quicker and it's going to be one, we're not going to be wasting water, which is, you know, beneficial to the department, and we're going to be able to help those people out who may have a running toilet or, or a leaking fixture that they wouldn't catch for potentially six months. Yep. So in the next slide, we put together our existing um, versus our proposed rates, and you'll notice that the rates for the tiers, or the yeah, the rates for the tiers, remain the same. But with the move to quarterly billing, we did cut the consumption tiers in half. We did modify um, tier three and tier four to allow for a little bit more consumption. Um, the base rate also, as it will be billed four times instead of two, <coughs> will be cut in half, and the other. Um, recurring charges, which is our fire sprinkler for commercial and residential, our water service type plan, and the late fees would require adjustment um, as those would also be billed quarterly. Um, and just, just to touch directly on those, we're currently billing the commercial fire at $130 biannually, the residential fire sprinkler service $80, the service type we do a one time payment of $68, and the late fee would be incurred at each at each billing period. Um, so those would move for commercial fire to $65, residential fire to $40, service tight. We're proposing to move that to a quarterly um, quarterly charge. We've found that we run into instances where residents will sign up, and because it's only billed once a year, they'll reach out to us, you know, on that bill that they're not charged service uh, service tight and say, hey, I thought I signed up and I, am, I, am I enrolled in this program? And we have to explain, yes, you are enrolled. 
but we only bill it once a year, so it only comes up on that whichever bill it goes out to. The only way that they are taking off the water service type plan is if they actually contact us and request to be taken off. Other than that, we're, they're automatically billed consistently. Correct. And then the late fee, obviously, as we're going to be billing quarterly, we would reduce that in half. Um, and just for a disclaimer, that the rates and fees outlined in this presentation will not go into effect until we do do the required legal notification in a public rate hearing, and that there are rates and fees that are charged by the department that are not going to be impacted by the move to quarterly billing, and those would remain unchanged. So. Moving on, just to go over what the proposed billing schedule would be. Um, the billing period one where would, would be the anticipated mailing date would be October 15th, the due date November 15th, and the usage period for that would be July through September. Um, billing period two, the usage period October through December with a mail date of January 15th and a due date of February 15th. Billing period three, January, February, March, um, with a mail date of April 15th, due date of May 15th, and billing period four would be April, May, June, with the mailing date July 15th and the due date August 15th. And these do stagger slightly with the um, tax bills. So they're, I think it's two or three week. So when people see their tax bill, they would know, okay, my water bill is going to be coming in a few weeks or going to be due in a few weeks. Um, and one thing to note that, you know, subject to approval of the board and, and the rate hearing, the first quarterly bills would be issued in July, um, on July 15th. And the July bill, if we, you know, move forward with this, would be with the new rate structure but would not include a base rate. And that's because the residents have already paid right. the, the base rate for the fiscal year. So they wouldn't be paying for those customers on the water pay service plan wouldn't be charged that rate either because they've already covered for this year. It would be strictly consumption. Okay. So moving on to the next slide is our revenue projections and for the upcoming fiscal year of 2019. So you can see through the, the graph, the chart on the left, um, as Mike alluded to, the majority of our revenue comes from our summer consumption. So that billing, that first bill in October, which is gonna cover July, August, and September, is gonna be our biggest um, source of revenue for the year. And that we're estimating or projecting is gonna be to around just over $2 million. The second bill going out um, in January is going to generate <coughs> 945, again, proposed, projected to generate 945,000. The third billing period would be 568, and the fourth would be 736. So the total water rate revenue would be $4.26 uh, million. And when we add in all of our other recurring fees and, and rates, it brings a total revenue projection for FY19 of $4.98 million. And just below that is the budget summary outlining our um, operating expenses. The total anticipated operating expenses for FY19 is $4.238 million. Any Matthew. questions or comments from the board for the day at this time? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you all. Yeah. I mean, I know, you've, I know you've put a lot of time and effort into this to do the best we can for the town, so I really do appreciate it. Um, and I think this is something that uh, we can definitely consider, you know, for the best of the town, especially down the road to um, fulfill our capital plan. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. So I don't know if we want to get into right now before Michael does his kind of second presentation, mm -hmm. if the board is comfortable with what is proposed on that third slide, which I'll pull So back. I guess the question here is, are we comfortable with our um, proposed rates from usage 
to um, from the one to fifteen for the tier one to one to the eight thousand, eight thousand one to fifteen thousand, fifteen thousand one to forty thousand, and then tier four would be forty plus thousand. Yes, as well as the recurring um, charges and the base rate adjustment. Right, and just to be clear, the base rate is not changing. The base rate is staying the same. The base rate. The annual cost for the base rate is remaining the same. Right, we're just breaking it up. We're, yes. So can I ask a question? Because I know someone's going to ask me. If, if they, um, in the first two months, if they're in Tier 1, does it get prorated? If when they go over Tier 1, does just that last month get charged Tier 2? Or yeah, is so the whole three months charged Tier 2? So I think... What you're referring to is, yeah. So if we let's just use you know billing gallons. period billing period one for example, which is July, August, September. If through the month of July and August they use eight thousand gallons, and then the month of August they consume another five thousand gallons, that five thousand gallons would be charged to rate. tier two, and the first you know eight thousand would be charged in tier one. Mr. Thompson. No, I'm good. I'm so, I, good. so we're comfortable with the proposed rates structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, I think this is the right direction to go when you <coughs> when you think of all, all, all over the years, all the issues like frozen pipes, frozen meters, all these types of things. That this is just so beneficial to us and the ratepayers uh, uh, to not to do it. Uh, you know. All that effort to change over the meters to radio read and everything—it uh, just is—it's uh, all going in the right direction and a far more efficient, uh, less water loss, the whole thing. I agree. So, has uh, the only way. To <coughs> uh, right. uh, um, uh, may I comment? Absolutely. Um, not only am I fully supportive, but I—I I like the fact that Dan picked up on some of the uh, we didn't really talk too much about this uh, before but the part about um, the leaks is a really big <coughs> deal and being able to notify people in advance yep. um, and not only that but if you know as you go forward it's a better opportunity to provide price signaling to people they're just more aware of their usage um, but I, I work with a community a, a city that's looking at to monthly reads staying with quarterly billing but they want to read monthly so they can catch those leaking toilets and things that, because yeah. you know you have an elderly person coming in, they didn't know, they're hard of hearing, whatever, and they have a five thousand dollar water bill because it's been running yeah. constantly, yeah. and you know as meter technology improves, it's easier for the departments to do more frequent reading. So I think it's a step in the right direction. They also asked me um, to weigh in on that rate structure, and you really haven't changed anything. You know, they're exactly implementing the same thing, broken down over a, a four period instead of two. So the, the same comments about your existing rate structure still apply. That, you know, um, and, and one of my recommendations were to look at that tier three, you know, like we talked about. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to uh, slice the numbers. But in all, I'm, I'm, you know, for what it's worth, very supportive of this move. Well, Thank you. The, the, the only thing that... The only uh, caveat I uh, have about it all is uh, a, a dry year versus a wet year. Uh, you know, we've, I've seen what the wet years are like. I've seen what mm. the dry years, and it, it does uh, it does make a difference. You know? Sure does. Yeah, it's it's one to one, and like I said, it's not. You know, I, I, the prototypical Cape Cod lawn is, you know, a little bit of turf grass in the in the backyard area, and it's mostly pine cones and you know that kind of stuff um, so it's as much the people that are not coming or coming that's right. is uh, that are using the water and it's the industry you know the to the restaurants and all that stuff so and I would ask just if we would like to hold a public rate hearing um, the the nearest available date to do that would be on um, May 4th. May 4th. And if you guys are in support of this, I would ask that, you know, 
you guys make a motion to support it, and then we would proceed with the legal advertisement for that um, those hearings. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hear a motion to support the proposed rates. Uh, I, Mr. Chairman, I move that uh, we move forward and adopt the uh, quarterly billing uh, and the rate structure as presented. Uh, and we'll take a vote on that May 4th at a public hearing. Correct. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so May 4th uh, at the Water Department. Um, and Unless, um, I didn't know, and Jamie and I were talking about this earlier, if we wanted to do it here just so that it could be Is recorded or yeah. Yeah. shown live. Yeah, I have sure. no, I, I, I'd rather do it here yeah. so we can have it you know, taped. Does that work for Jamie? <laughs> 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 All right, Jamie, his signal looks okay. So uh, May 4th, 7, 8, 7 a.m., in the Griffin Room Town Hall. Excellent. And again, thank you for, for all your work. Appreciate it. All right. We want to hand it back, back over to back, back to Mike. Everybody um, good with time? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 No, the the model is works great on your computer. It doesn't want to print. It doesn't want to project. It's just a sort of a beast. Um, but what I can do is I'll, I'll zoom in too. So I'm just going to go quickly through um, the elements that, that go into um, a rate analysis and how we look <coughs> at different components. So um, we start with usage. And we'll look back, so everything that we do, we look back five years and we look forward 10 years. Um, and the reason I do 10 years is I don't suggest that you set those rates that far in advance, although you can. It really just gives you some breathing room when you're looking to see if you have, um, for example, if you were suspecting you had a, a plan upgrade or a major project happening a few years out, you can, you can put in everything that you can see and just have an idea of what's coming. And I, I think it's, you know, part of this is geared towards transparent and data-driven decision-making. So it's very justifiable from your position to say, well, yes, we, we know that that might be happening and this is what we're doing in anticipation or not. So you're, a, um, you're actually a pretty good-sized water system. So um, it's nice to be able to put a 10-year a plan in even understanding that the first five years is much more visible and tangible than the, than the rest. So, um, uh, this is my demo, so I, I've been clearly been playing with it. So we look at that, that consumption and we, we have a lot of discussion around where do you think that this is gonna go. So I'm projecting a sharper decrease in um, consumption and yeah, so. Yeah, this is what the, the data more supports is a 1% decrease. So when we think about that, what do we think is going to happen in the next, you know, 10 years for consumption? Where are those trends going? Um, it's important because if I, or if we are too aggressive, and I look at some communities, it's going down 4%, you know. If I, if I project 4% 10 years, the, the model is going to want really high rate increases to get there. Um, and you know, we don't need to ruffle people's feathers unnecessarily, but if I am too conservative and we were to say just project off last year, then it's implying that revenues that may not happen are gonna happen. And it's like, oh, this looks great. We don't need to do much. And then you're like, wait a minute, it's not happening that I'm not getting that money. So it's that balance of striking between what we think we see. And we can build in, um, the whole model, like I said, is built off projections. But if you knew, for example, that 
no, we have this big development or hotel or whatever. We can, you can just add in, you know, specific elements that you see. So after we um, put in all the usage, we look at your expenses and um, we look back again, five years, we, we load the whole chart of accounts in there, which is the, um, your budget to actual reports or, you know, usually get some form of accounting report that says this is how you're trending. And I look at the actual costs. I don't look at budgeted costs, I look at actuals because you want the model to be, it, it has to have some conservancy, some, some I don't wanna say fluff, but you, you have to have a little Buffer. cushion in there, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. for conservatively, conservancy. Um, and when you look at budgets, budgets are all over the place, you know, they, they, it's kinda hard to tell where that extra is. So I like to look at the actuals. This is what you've actually spent. And you know, we, we look at the, um, the trends and look at the period average and we say, okay, mm -hmm. what do we think is gonna happen? So we'll pick a start value and say, um, you know, in this case for this particular line item, the period average was 100,000, but we look back and we say, you know, based on the last couple of years, we think 95,000 is more appropriate. What do you think? And we go through these um, sort of painfully one at a time, and we can escalate each one of these lines individually. And we look at a number of um, escalators, you know, we track energy costs, CPI, all that kind of thing. And we can pick different um, escalation values based on what we think different uh, costs are gonna go. And again, it's, I'm sorry, this is hard to see, but these are those same line items. And here we're just projecting in what we think it's gonna go. And like I said, if, if say we're, you know, we projected this 6,300 for FY18, and then at the end of FY18, Dan says, no, that was really 7,500 then the model, will, you can just overwrite it. And that's how you can use it to sort of true up as you go. You can just put back in whatever you actually had and we can trend the what we thought versus um, what's actually happening. On the revenue side, um, we do the same thing. There's, there's two kinds of revenue. There's uh, rate revenue and non-rate revenue. So your Rate revenue is the water bills, and your non-rate revenue is basically everything else, and that includes liens, uh, penalties, interest, that sort of thing. Uh, for liens, what, I, what I'll do is summarize um, the liens in the previous year revenue. Like every town's a little bit different, but a lot of times you'll see 2017, then you'll see 16 receipts, 15 receipts, 14 receipts in that year. Those are coming in from um, when they get settled in tax title, they come in that way, or just in the fact the liens. So to make a sh long story short, I just look at how does that trend as a percentage of your current year revenue, because I can model that. So we can say, yeah, every year you get about 8% in, in, of your current year's receipts in the form of liens from previous years. So we look at that. What's kind of, um, uh, I, I think is interesting, or uh, uh, the right way to do it, is we don't, project revenue, we calculate it. We calculate it based on the projected consumption and the number of accounts that we've trended to go up or down. And um, like I said, we're looking back five, looking forward 10, but we use those last two years of what they call test years to, to calibrate, to make sure. I mean, I, I wouldn't wanna come in and say, you need to raise your raise 5% and um, my error margin is 7%. I mean, what am I telling you? So I like to know how close am I getting. So. What we do for those two test years is we compare against your commitments, which is what you should have collected from all those, like the summation of all the bills that went out is recorded by the town in the form of commitments, is what they expect. Mm -hmm. So when I calibrate and I look at my model and I say, okay, I'm less than 2% uh, error there, and the reason for the error is always in the consumption data somewhere. There's a, sometimes readings that get corrected at the bill time don't make their way back into the data. So we're just looking to see, you know, I like to see certainly under 5%, but usually I can get to like two or 3%. And that tells me that we're, we're, we're close enough. Then I actually look at um, what is your collection ratio? How much of your, your bills are you collecting based on comparing the commitments to your actual receipts? Because what we're trying to model is, is 
money in the door, not not potential money or not theoretical money. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this this sheet um, is uh, I've I've greatly simplified it for my model purposes, but you can put in uh, this is the sheet that Dan likes because you can add in. Um, a project, you can say we're going to start remetering, even though I, I just heard that you already did that, and we're going to spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but we're going to do that over um, ten years, and we're going to fund that right out of our um, our rates, so we can see that we're we're carrying that cost. Um, if you were going to put in. Um, you know, say instead of water meters, it was going to be um, a new booster station. I can't type when people are watching. Um, I'll just do this quick and say that was going to be, I don't know, 500000 And we think we can fund that out of our reserves. We can pick a year, and you see as you move that forward, it escalates with the potential cost of construction. And we can pick what as inflation factor. Right now, I'm using four and a half percent because construction prices have been going up pretty pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. We can also look at well, that's too much, so let's debt that at you know two percent. We think we're going to get SRF money, and that'll amortize that. So where that comes into play is we come here at our dashboard. We look at. Uh, a much simplified version of your chart of accounts. We don't want to see um, every single thing here because it's just information overload. So we break it down into basic expenses. And this is all, this, this is not just like a template off the shelf. We customize it to each, each community. It's like semi-custom, you know. So we adapt it based on your chart of accounts, how you manage expenses, that kind of thing. And we come forward, we look at first, this is... Um, and this is a good example, and the, and the way I rigged this example is for, like, a big project coming. You know, if you knew you had a cost, gosh, we need to put in a new water tank, whatever. Um, you can see in this community the, the green line is your projected revenue, and, and notice that it's a slight downward tilt because that means that your, your consumption is going down. So this is based on no rate changes. You're losing, you know, you're, you're losing steam a little bit as you go. The bars are your various components of your um, expenses. So the top here is your total expenditures, or in another way of looking at it, your revenue needs. Um, can you guys see that okay? Um, so in this, and this is very typical. So right now, this is um, a little bit above. They're doing good. They're, this, this line here is your retained earnings balance, and that's what I was referring to as the water tank level. So as Revenue is higher than expenses, you're contributing. So it's going up, it's going up. And here we start to see we're starting to lose steam. We're going down, we're going down, we're going down. So this model, um, I refer to it as crashing. It crashes in 22, that they would not no longer be able to satisfy their demands and they would not have enough money. So the band, sir, you asked um, where we put that retained earnings. I want to see it in this band here. And this upper rate, um, that upper rate is set at 50%, but if you said that's, um, you know, we think that that's too high, um, we can say let's put that at, you know, 30%, and that changes. So everything's dynamic. Everything runs through from one end to the other. If you make any change anywhere, it updates everywhere else. Um, so the fun part is, um, when it's time to set rates. So I've been playing with this. Like I said, this is my, my demo model. So we know that they have to do something. You just saw a 75% re rate increase would get you here. But, you know, we could also look at, well, what if we did 10 for, you know, four years? Well, look, that'll work too. And that, that's what I mean by giving you the ability to plan ahead. So... If, if, and I'm not suggesting that you do have this monster, my sense is you probably don't, it's just more of a planned investment. But even if you have something big happening, and I, I see this happen, 
if you, you know, especially on wastewater, well, we get our new permits and we think, and da, 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 it could be $50 million, but it's not for four or five years. Right. Now's the time to plan because, you know, as a consultant, the biggest thing we can do for our clients is help them maintain control of their destiny and not put you into a situation where you're, you're against the wall and you have to do something drastic. So, like I said, I don't see anything, um, you know, really pernicious in your future. But again, you never know. So that's why we want to maintain those reserves in a reasonable line that, that you can um, project. And then the most important part, um, and this is where the, the rubber meets the road, is we look at rate impacts. And because that, that's what everybody's concerned about. What does this do financially? And this is a direct function of um, the size of your system, too. When you have, you know, you have like 15,000 customers, is that right? 10,000 accounts. Okay. So that's a nice number because if it's really small, it becomes like a condo. You know, like the eight people that live in the condo are paying for the roof. They're splitting it. You know, it's, it's hard with small systems. But we look at the, um, what are the cost implications the model is set up so we can do three scenarios at once because there's a number you might say, no, I want to hit it hard right away. No, I want to spread it out. No, you know, so we can do three different versions and see how they look. And what we do is we look at a typical residential customer. Um, this is that residential gallons per day per capita that we talked about. We'll, we'll pick the number for you and, and put that in there and look at what is their change in quarterly bill? What does that look like as a quarterly dollar increase? What does their total annual cost look like? What does that change in annual cost look like? And so in this case, um, and because I've been monkeying around with it, um, they may not, um, we may not have alternatives that are exactly the same. But what I usually see is if I take the five year annual cost for the different alternatives and add them up, it's, it's just my own personal rule of thumb. Like, what does the total five-year cost for this family look like? And I compare the different alternatives. If they all work, they're all about the same. You can front load it, you can even it out, you can back load it, you know, you can do a lot of different things. And then we also look at um, <coughs> what they call the residential indicator, which is a, um, an EPA measure of affordability that looks at your dollars you spend on as a family in your water or sewer bill as a percentage of the median household income of the community. And 2% is the indicator that that shows a stress, a stressor. Um, you are probably not even close to that. And uh, one, because your MHI is probably uh, a little higher than state average. And two, because your costs are fairly low. But we look at that just to understand. And I won't tell anybody what you can afford. I'm not going to say it's the five buck lunch or the the cappuccino because you know you turn it to Sally Struthers. It's just regular coffee, man. You know, <laughs> I, I can't. I don't. Do I, I feel like those commercials from the '80s, like thirty cents a day. <laughs> How much would you pay? <laughs> but it, we we bring it down to that level because yeah. that's what's important to you because you have constituents and you know the people of the town. Um, other things that we can look at depending on how you're set up is um, your low usage customers. Those are always the the um, you know, the fixed income people, you know, we have an ability to look at the, the rates themselves. This is a sort of fairly typical rate structure where you have meter fees based on meter size. And then in this case, they have residential and commercial. And when I said semi-custom, what I'll do is even if you didn't have meter fees on a quarterly basis, I'll leave that in there because then we can play with it. We can add it. You know, the model's already built for it. So, well, what if we did this? So. You know, one community I'm looking at going from um, these capital improvement fees, which are kind of hard to manage, to just quarterly meter charges. What does that look like? Um, and you can play with the, uh, you know, you can change the tiers. The way it's set up numerically is that it uses, it applies the rate increase across the board, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can, you can change it to the consumption only or to the fee only or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really the overview. What I like is that it lets people from both the town finance side and the operation side kind of come together and understand you're more integrated here. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, they, they do that up at town hall. 
Like, what is an enterprise? You need to run it like a business. You you need to understand your financials. They need to understand. You know, when I when I look at the forms they fill out for the state, the A twos, and I, I always look at the projected income. Where did you come up with that? Because I've been seeing your water use going down for the last five years, and you projected an increase. Well, I mean, we we took that, and we you know, so this helps get people on board, and you know, and I'm I'm not trying to sell it. I mean, it is what it is, but it it supports transparent decision making too. If someone comes in and they're really opposed to something, you can sit them down and say, "This is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. What do you think?" You know, so I like that. And can you split out, can you dig deeper into the data with summer versus year round? Yeah, it, so. Obviously we're two very different kind of communities depending on the time of year. You are, and outside of the um, model is the consumption analysis. And we look at, um, I don't think if that was, Um, the scary part, you guys can see right into the sausage factory here. <laughs> um, and I guess my question is, you, we get questions sometimes about equity. Is there is there any difference if you're a year-round residence versus a summer residence as oh far boy. as? Yeah. Uh, can I tell ask you that's not the first time I've heard that? <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, and it's. As far as impact on a budget and, yeah, you know, yeah, long term yeah. planning. But, uh, no, oh, this was the one I did, yeah. 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 I mean, but our rates are set. And right. Regardless, if you use more water, you pay more. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we, talking about digging deeper, um, not all of the analysis that I did was reflected in our, our memo and our. Um, presentation, but we looked at, um, you know, histograms for the, your consumption patterns. And this is, again, this shows how many people or how many accounts by, by count were in that 10,000 bucket, how many were in 15,000. You see the cumulative percentage going on. Mm. Um, when I talk about that rate impact, um, we model it for the typical residential user, but you can do it for a variety. So, um, for example, if you had some commercial accounts, or if you had a big one, you know, like yeah, some places I look at, they have a hood milk facility in their town, which is more of a wastewater issue, but we'll look specifically at them or like three targets. Um, to answer your question as best I can, it's, it's basically, it, it should be, just based on their usage. So a, a summer house in the winter time, um, they need to pay the same base rates because you're still ready to serve them, to put out a fire, to do whatever okay. they need to do regardless. Even if everybody stopped using water, you're still ready to go. And that's why costs go up by meter size because it's reflective of the amount of water they could demand okay. in any time. Um, so really what it comes down to is if you have a summer house that, and I, you know, it, it individually, but a summer house is usually not just for, you know, some person and his, and his, and their spouse, it's the whole family. It's the camp. You know how it is. Oh, this, this, you know, this sibling's going down on, on this weekend, that sibling's going down on this weekend. And it's, you know, the variety goes through the, the year versus just two people in the winter time. Um, it, it should, we do look for what I call um, interclass subsidies. You know, is one class subsidizing another? Mm -hmm. But under the way we're talking about and with your rate structure, it should even no out. No impact. There's okay. no penalty for being a, a seasonal or around the year. They're not paying more than their share, right? Thank it's you. all based on That's good. how much you use. I, I mean, I love the the, yeah. the I product. Mean, you know, I mean, yeah. it, I oh, it's great to be yeah. able to plug in different things and see how it, you know, impacts. and yeah. where we've been talking about 
you know, our capital plan and looking out to 2031 and some of the big things that, that are coming up for the department over the next 10, 12 years, I think something like that would definitely help make it clear to not only the residents but other, you know, boards and departments, you know, what the intent is and, you know, the transparency. And right. Definitely help us plan our budget too to. Right. Well, the other nice thing is, so here's, here's your trap, right? You go to town meeting for an article, everybody votes for it, they're happy, they think they're never going to see you again. Right, you come before your board of selectmen if you need to do that to raise rates, and they think that's great. They think they're never going to see you again. So if we come here, if you, even if you're setting rates year by year, we could say, yep, based on what we see and what we know, that's sort of the catchphrase. We think we need this. Yes, in four years, I think we're going to need a higher rate increase. We're going to see how it goes till then, and it starts a line of communication where they're not surprised. Right. Yeah. People don't say, oh my God, I didn't know that. You never told us this and our rates are fine. And you right. know, it just shows that you're doing your due diligence right. on, on your side. And I found it to be very successful because the, the comments I get were, are like, I've never seen the data presented that way before. This is really clear, you know, I, li I like this. Um, and you know, so it, it just helps with that, that process. One of the things uh, uh, that I see in the future of this department is uh, those early uh, early years, the first 30 years of the department are going to come back to haunt us in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So old water mains, old this, old sure. that, tanks, whatever. So we're never done. And you, you, you never finish, you know. Uh, we're gonna Very go common. Back, uh, uh, one of the best moves the town made was the developers put in water mains in the subdivision. Yep. Well, that's all pretty much stopped now, and, mm -hmm. uh, but it's there, you know, as far as new goes. But to go back, revert back to the uh, old and aging side of it, uh, that's not going to go away. Nope. So uh, you see it now, we're various areas we're planning, even moving ahead to upgrade water mains and that. But uh, more and more, that's going to appear and be of a problem for this department. Uh, uh, you can't do it all at once because it took them years to do it. That's a great um, point because I, I'm looking at another community that I'm working with that's probably about the same size but off scale. And they had a master plan done and it had, you know, phase one, phase two water main improvements and there was no dates or times. So just sitting alone in the privacy of my office, I'm just thinking, huh, so how do we phase this? And there's a couple of ways to approach capital planning. One is the driven side where I'm concerned about that well, I'm not sleeping at night, I need to do this, or I have a letter from DEP telling me I have to do this. Then it, it is what you is and you fight for what you need. The other one is I've got $50 million that they're telling me I need to do over the next 30 years. Yep. So we can, you sort of seesaw into it, you say, all right, um, what I did for that other community was looked at, um, we, we projected all the costs for those different projects, and then I looked at um, what I consider some reasonable rate increases. What does 10% buy you in terms of excess capacity? Then how many millions of dollars amortized is that? And try to seesaw into, then you say, all right, you guys can afford about you know $2 million a year in debt for this, so start grouping projects in like five year groups and just add them up by setting, um, you know, these dates to be the same. So we say, all right, these five projects, we'll do them all in, um, 2023, so it pushes that out. And we look at what does that look like? And, and you say, all right, Okay, that looks good, but it's going to take us 250 years to get our projects done. All right, let's go. What does this get you? You know, and I, I don't like yeah. to throw numbers around um, because they can be inflammatory. And some of my more recent models, I, I think I might just adopt. Instead of just showing the number of the rate increase, we show the quarterly increase first. Because uh, inevitably, if I start talking to people and say, well, you need to raise them 12%, 
people start banging the table and say, I didn't get a 12% raise to pay last year and that kind of thing. And then when you say it's about eight bucks a quarter, and they go, oh. So you kind of get them all, all whipped up about nothing. So try to front load that a little bit more to, 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 you know, that we're conscious of the impasse. We're not, because frankly, if, you know, we move forward and I'm working for you, you're not paying me. Well, you guys are paying me because you're rate payers. That's where, you know, so I never forget that connection that these are people that have to pay for this. Um, and most of the time, water's still pretty inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't That's the Comcast. Yeah. It isn't <laughs> the cost of the water itself. It's the cost of getting it to them. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, and the Cape is blessed with an abundant water supply. Oh, yeah. um, and it, it's higher than ever this year. Yeah. 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 So, but you're also very susceptible because you have a thin overburden. You know, it's a, it's a very vulnerable aquifer. For as much activity, and you got, you know, 10 feet of sand over your water supply. Yeah. That's yeah. scary sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, do you have any questions or you want to see anything? Anything else? <coughs> Good. Yeah, Good. thank you very much for thank the presentation. You. Yeah. yeah, it was thank very you. helpful. Thank you for having me. It's going to be cold with us all. Kind of tight, kind of yeah. tight budget in town hall. Ah. Turn the heat on. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> this is our welcome this energy saving. <laughs> Dan, superintendent's report. So I have one thing that I just wanted to announce. Um, I received this week that we did. Um, we were, again, one of the top scoring water systems and have received the Drinking Water Suppliers Award for calendar year 17 and 2018 PWS awards. So we typically get the, um, you know, the excellence in medium and large water systems but because we've received that award in 2015, 2016, and 2017, they bumped us out to the consecutive, um, what do they call it? Uh, winner's circle? Yeah, basically. The, <laughs> we're receiving the consecutive winner's award. The trifecta. So, was that? The trifecta? Yeah, so we'll be eligible for the official medium and large one again next year, but for this fourth year because we've won it. They want to allow other systems to be able to win the award as well. So when you set the bar high, you, you know, you can take the, the top guy out and lower your standard. That's not right. I, <laughs> not my department. That's what I said before. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said before. So right. um, right. that's a, a high point as well. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it takes, it takes a lot and everybody in the department, um, you know, really puts in a lot of time and effort to make sure it happens, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. No, we, uh, we're blessed for the, the great group of employees, believe me. Every one of them. Yep. Is that it, Dan? Yes. All right, uh, <laughs> commissioner's report? Anything from the commissioner? I got nothing. Any? No. Uh, just, just a quick mention, um, I did do my um, TV interview, I guess, yesterday for um, candidates that are um, unopposed and um, it was a couple of questions were, um, you know, why you're running, um, past experience, and projects that you've accomplished or coming up. And I went over the Lothrop tank and the Skater tank. And again, um, just to reiterate, you know, those weren't my accomplishments. You know, that was the department's accomplishments. That's something that you guys really you led by example, especially with the Skater system and the, um, you know, the two hundred thousand dollars that you know we saved the, the, our customers by what you were able to do with, with the employees. And um, those are things I just mentioned that the department was doing, but again, that was just all on, on what you guys do then, and we're very fortunate. So again, thank you for, um, for what you do for us. Um, but other than that, our next meeting will be May 4th here in the Griffin Room, um, and that will be a public hearing for um, rate structure. All right, uh, motion to close the meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.